Good evening and welcome to the Veterans Forum. This is a new public service that this station is putting on in conjunction with the Library of Congress, wherein we are trying to invite any and all veterans, male and female, who served in any of the wars, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, you name it. If they would like to share their memories with us, we're here to help them do that, to add to the history. Tonight is our first program, and I have the honor and the fun, if you will, of presenting our first candidate, our first volunteer, an old friend and buddy, Carol Kane. Carol, for the record, yeah. would you pronounce your name and spell your last name, please? Carol Kane, K-A-N-E. Oh, perfect. <laughs> what were your branch of your service? Uh, I was in the uh, various branches. Uh, most of the time I was in the Air Force, as it was called in those days, Army Air Force. And uh, But part of the time I was in the 12th Armored Division, which is a... Okay. What were your service dates, active duty time? Uh, I was in from January 1943 until January 1946. Good. A little bit For of fun three time, years. huh? Yeah, just about exactly uh, 36 months. To kind of set the stage, uh, let's go back and do a little bit of the history, if you will. Uh, where were you born and when? I was born in Alliance, Nebraska in 1923. I grew up there, I went to high school. And after high school, I went out to Los Angeles to go to school at UCLA. <clears throat> I was there for one year, and when I came home in 1942, the summer of 42, I worked at an air base construction job in my hometown. And uh, rather than go back to school in September, I waited until the job was going to end at Thanksgiving and I was going to go back in January. However, my friends and neighbors had other ideas. Oh, you were greeted, huh? I was greeted. <laughs> you were greeted, yeah. Where did you enter the service? Where were you inducted? I was inducted at Fort Francis E. Warren in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And then after a two-week leave, I went to Fort Logan in Denver, Colorado, where I was <clears throat> given an inaugural talks and speeches and all that all as everybody stuff, got, yeah. got my uniforms and what have you and was there for a few days and was then shipped to St. Petersburg, Florida for my basic training and the Signal Corps attached to the Air Force. <coughs> I was in St. Pete for just one month and uh, while we were there our basic training consisted of close order drill and uh, calisthenics on the beach. We had a calisthenics instructor by the name of Manny Perez, who had been a pitcher for the Los Angeles yeah. Angels before he got in the service. And uh, so at the end of a month, they loaded up 800 or 1,500 of us and shipped us out to California to a place called Hammer Field. We sat there at Hammer Field for a month doing nothing. And, uh, nothing? Absolutely nothing, just sitting there waiting. Couldn't even go to town, we just stayed on the post. While there, I did take the test for the Army Specialized Training Program. And uh, at the end of the month, we were marched around town to Camp Pinedale at the other side of Fresno. We stayed there for a couple of weeks and was shipped to Indiana to go to Radio Mechanic School. After three months of Radio Mechanic School in Indiana, and I have here a picture of the class that I was in in Indiana at the radio school, which was very interesting. Uh, at the end of that, we were shipped back to Camp Pinedale. And in a month or so at Camp Pinedale, I went home for furlough to uh, Alliance for Thanksgiving time. And when I got back, I found that I was, had been selected for ASTP. And Good was shipped up to Sacramento Junior College. At Sacramento, we were there for two, two months. While there, we did our refresher courses in physics, chemistry, English, <coughs> and uh, that was about it. But uh, we went through a whole freshman year of college physics and college right. math in two, in two months. Uh, it shows you can be done. Put good men and, in the uh, job. <laughs> at the end of that, we were shipped to 
uh, school at Texas College of Mines and Metallurgy, which is now called the University of Texas, El Paso. We're there for three, six weeks, and the Army decided that they needed schoolboys much better than they needed, I mean, needed soldiers much more than they needed schoolboys. Mm -hmm. And they disbanded the lower half of the ASDP program. All of us who were in West Texas and New Mexico wound up in the 12th Armored Division. That's a switch. Yeah, so I wound up, as it turned out, in the infantry in the 12th, 12th Armored Division. An armored division is made up of three tank battalions, three artillery battalions, and three infantry battalions with attached engineers, signal corps, and what have you for service outfits. While there, I uh, <clears throat> initially was in a rifle squad, but the first sergeant looked at my records and saw that I was a radio mechanic and assumed that I knew how to operate a radio as well mm -hmm. as work on one. <laughs> which wasn't necessarily true, but in any event, I wound up being assigned to operate the command half-track radio. And uh, after a while, I got transferred out of the rifle company and into the headquarters section. And uh, it just happened that the communications sergeant, which is the only communications personnel in an armored infantry company, they have six radios, but they only have one person assigned as communications man. So the rest of them are just operated by people in the squads or what have you. So I got transferred to headquarters section to work with the keep communications the rifle squad sergeant. Up to Manning, yeah. Rather than having the rifle squad lose a man every time we went in the yeah. field or something. Well, it just happened that the communications sergeant's first name was Carol also. Oh. Uh, and he's the second person I'd ever met who had the same first name as I did. And uh, after a while, it got to the point where if the company commander was looking for something to do with communications, he just hollered, Carol, and he didn't care. Which one got there who first? Who showed up. <laughs> so uh, we went through training in Texas. And in September, we were shipped to Nyack, New York, to Camp Shanks to be get ready to go to overseas. Uh -huh. We were there for about two weeks, and then we got on the train and went to Hoboken. POE? Got on a ferry boat and went across to the piers in, Law in Manhattan and got aboard the Empress of Australia, which was originally had been a North German Lloyd liner in the, that the Germans had passed over to the English as part of reparations from World War I. And then we, uh, <coughs> it became part of the Canadian Pacific Line, and was the ship that the King and Queen came to the United States in 1939. And you had the same privilege and so yes, forth? Yes, we did. <laughs> Fine wine and dining, did. huh? <laughs> we wound up, my company wound up down in the bilges, you might say. We were as far forward and as far down in the ship as one could go. So we had hammocks. and No bunks? No bunks. Tables were mounted, bolted to the deck. So we slept on the tables, under the tables, or swung in hammocks above them, depending on what so we felt like. You joined the Navy. <laughs> yeah, and uh, our company commander, of course, the officers had quarters topside. Mm -hmm. However, the gentleman we had for a company commander spent most of his time down in the hold with the rest of with us. With the guys. Good man. Yes, Good he man. was. Where'd you land when you took we, off? When we you took to off, we were supposed to land in Cherbourg, but because of a submarine scare, we wound up landing in Liverpool about midnight one night, and we got off the boat and got onto a train on the dock and took us down to camp outside of London where the uh, Air Force, uh, the paratroopers had just taken off from a couple of days before to land it. A 101? On the, I don't know which, Okay. whether it was 101 or 82nd, but one of the two had just taken off to go into the market garden. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were there for a few days, and then we loaded on trucks and went down to Tidworth Barracks, which is an old, way back British military post. And the armored, the infantry battalions were up on the hill in tents. The rest of them were down in the old barracks. I'm not sure which was better or which was worse. Yeah. Yeah. Those old barracks dated from pre-Boer War times, 
Was that a pre-staging area then, getting ready yeah, to go? Yeah, we were just sitting there waiting till we gathered up our vehicles and stuff. We were there for just about a month, and then we went down to Southampton and got aboard a British transport and went across to Le Havre. We landed in France on Armistice Day, 1944. Oh, and uh, a little ironic, huh? Yeah, we w pulled in, well, we got off the ship we were on onto LCVPs and pulled up on the beach and got off and walked up the hill to a, a bunch of the Red Ball Express trucks. Oh, well, that was Patton's special, wasn't it? Uh, well, it was the his, troops that were supporting yeah. him. And uh, <clears throat> they loaded us up and we drove around until about midnight and we landed, it was still daylight. But uh, our advance party somehow got lost and we wound, they wound up where we were supposed to be about midnight. <laughs> and. Uh, unloaded and all got out and pitched our tents, pup tents, and in a field, randomly, obviously, any place we could park. And instead of two guys getting together, we got three, put one one shelter half on the ground the and, bottom, yeah. and then pitched a tent over it, and the three of us crawled in on our sleeping bags. Real buddy warm, huh? <coughs> Yeah, but at least it was drier than yeah, the wet field. Yeah, sleeping in the mud. But, yeah. So the yeah. next morning, of course, we had to get up Line them up. Tell them all up and line them up, dress right, dress, and all that They'll sort never of happy forget stuff. That. And we stayed there for <clears throat> two or three days in the field, and then we moved to a farm and built it in a barn. And uh, we were there for, oh, probably a week or so. And then we got on train on the trucks and went down to a place called Lunaville. And we were there for a few days. And then... Uh, we went up to uh, outside of a place called Rohrbach where the division went first into action on the 12th of December. And uh, 56 was in support, and we were just up on a field watching the action, really, as these people tried to take this little town of Bischweiler. And uh, when they took it and we got ready to go into town, all the tracks in the company except the CP track were stuck in the mud. <laughs> so we had to wait. And <laughs> we got in, but the fall. rest of them had to wait until they dug up a <clears throat> tank retriever to pull them out. And uh, we stayed there in, in uh, Bischweiler for uh, a few days. Uh, when we, I had been sitting in the half track most of this time, uh, uh, operating radio, of course. Mm -hmm. So I like we were trying to do, you know, took your boots off, massage your feet, changed yeah, your, keep your socks, socks every on. day and all that time stuff. But anyway, mm -hmm. when we got into this town, we moved into these houses and uh, got into feather bed and the frostbite started to leave and nope. <laughs> feet got very uncomfortable to say the least. So we were there for a few days and one interesting incident that happened, the CP was in this house, and the company commander had his office in the front room, and those houses in that part of Alsace are, uh, the do doors are on the side of the house, not on the front facing the street. And there was a, a little al al alcove, and the barn's here, the house is here, and the door was over here facing mm -hmm. the barn. So uh, myself and another fellow were standing guard inside the entryway of the house there, the little foyer. And uh, every time somebody he heard a little noise, he'd click off his safety. And smart ass that I was, I said, no, oh, you don't need to do that. So I put the rifle in front of me and I rocked my finger forward, pushed the safety off, rocked it back and kaboom, blew a hole blew through the door. <laughs> Fortunately, no. But I did blow a hole through the door. So after everybody comes rushing out of the back rooms and everything. What's going on? Nothing, nothing going on today. And when everything was quiet, front door opened, room from the front room, and Captain Fairburn sticks his head out. Safe if I come out now, Carol? <laughs> of course, he could have court-martialed me, but oh, that was worse, really. Yeah, you weren't, you weren't doing as they used to do, frag him. <laughs> but uh, not him. No. Nobody was going to do that to him. And uh, so anyway, we wound up there for a while, and then we moved up to another 
place called Lettweiler inside of Germany, just inside the border, and relieved the 80th Infantry Division. And uh, they, uh, 80th went down to help Patton. He was, they were in Patton's army, and they moved mm. clear across the back of his whole army and went down to relieve Bastogne, them and the 4th Armored. So we stayed in Atweiler through Christmas week, and uh, one of the interesting things that happened at Christmas was the company was dug in on a hill, and we company commander had his CP set up in a house, and Carol Moyer and I went back to battalion for something one Sunday morning, and on the way back to company, we saw this Christmas tree, or this fir tree that had been knocked down by artillery. So we stopped, we stopped and cut the top. Uh -huh. six feet or so off of it, brought it back and asked the old man if we could put it up in the CP. Of course he agreed. And so we de decorated it with the foil, colored foils from the inside of the battery, the packages, batteries were sealed in. And there was a whole bunch of window out on the forward slope of the hill in front of a, where the guys were dug in. Would you tell people what the window is? window is an aluminum foil that they dropped from the airplanes to yeah. deflect radar to, and uh, <clears throat> so we saw that out there and thought that would make real nice decoration so the two of us <laughs> walked out on this forward slope <laughs> in the afternoon bright sunny day picking up window carrying it back to decorate the tree with Dumb. and the guys that were in the foxholes says the good lord takes care of fools because anybody around, any of us that stuck our head up got shot at. And you two clowns walk all over this forward slope, picking up window, and nobody says anything to you. Not a shot. So we decorated our Christmas tree and had, had a good and time. as that happened, the mail showed up just the day before Christmas wow, with some packages deal. and stuff. So it worked out to be a fairly decent Christmas considering everything. Mm -hmm. And of course we had turkey and all the trimmings. Of course, it was fried turkey rather than baked turkey, but, mm -hmm. uh, but it still tasted good. And now, did you have a field kitchen or did you just eat uh, wherever you could We had a field out. kitchen that came up with us. Oh, good. Fed us. But we ate wherever we, oh. we walked in the chow line and uh -huh. went back to wherever you were. I went back to half track. Good. I spent, High and dry, huh? I spent my 24 hours a day sitting in a half track with earphones in my head. I only left it when I got a message to go in and give it to the old man. I'd wake up in the middle of the night carrying a message to him and walk back and never remember I even did it. <laughs> and uh, so we sat there. <clears throat> One interesting thing that happened there, there was a, a light tank with a 37 millimeter gun on it parked on one side of the doorway, which the tank battalion that we were working with had uh, designated to support Cap Captain Fairburn. And then there was a, a cavalry recon vehicle, which also had a 37 millimeter on it, sitting on the other side of the doorway. And across the square was the church. And on the steps of the church was our gas dump, all uh, ca yeah, Jerry cans of yeah. gasoline. Well, sometime <laughs> during the night, there was some noise, and one of the guys in one of the, I don't remember which one of the two vehicles it was, but whichever one it was, heard the noise and didn't bother to look around. He just pulled the lanyard and kaboom, Blew 37 it. millimeter with <laughs> uh, shrap fra uh, shrapnel shell <laughs> went across the way and perforated all those gas cans. <laughs> so our gas dump was <laughs> draining down the church steps. Uh, we stayed there for a few days and then went back into reserve for from the first of the year until the 7th of January, at which time we were ordered up to attack the town of Hurlesheim and Orfendorf, the two towns. And to get to Hurlesheim, we had to go through a place that we chose to call the Waterworks. It was a water regulating plant on the Motor River. and. Uh, the bridge across the river was knocked out, but the, this building was a straddle of the river, so we could walk through the building and get oh. across the river, but the tanks couldn't get across. 
So instead of operating as the two task forces that we had been when we started, the 714th uh, Tank Battalion, less one company, and uh, the 56th had that tank battalion attached to it, and then uh, we were attached with the tank battalion, and uh, so because we couldn't get, they couldn't get across the bridge, we regrouped as just the ta infantry battalion to attack the town of Hurlesheim, which we did the next day on the 8th, and uh, got into the town. Uh, before the first day, though, when we were up there, uh, my one of my best friends, a fellow by the name of Bert Kruger, whose picture I have here, I think we showed it once before, but this is Bert here on the side, uh, was, was up uh, at going outside the waterworks there, and uh, he was shot and killed, mm. but they didn't know he was ki killed at the time, so. They Captain Fairburn had gone up to see what was going on, and I was stayed back with the company commander's tank of the 714th C Company. And uh, when we uh, got up there, or when the Captain got up there, he saw, well, there were two guys wounded out there. He went out to get, pull them back, and he got shot in the shoulder. However, it turns out that the two guys that he went out to get were both dead. Both dead, yeah. And uh, he came back to the tank that I was on, gave me his personal pistol to hang on to and turn into the supply truck when we got back to it. And uh, he walked on back to the aid station and that's the last I saw of him. However, he did rejoin the company sometime later, but by that time I was gone. Oh. And uh, so, the next morning we did get into the town of Hurlesheim and spent the night there. And uh, the next morning I, we went down to Lieutenant Russell and myself ran down from where we were down to the end where Captain Dress of A Company, who was the ranking officer in town, uh, to, had his CP and we ran down there to see what was going on. And uh, as we ran in the door, somebody hands us a bottle of schnapps because we hadn't had anything to eat for a couple of days, so somebody a couple of shots of schnapps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we didn't need to weave going back. I didn't need to consciously weave yeah. anyway. But anyway, we got back and uh, while we were standing there in this house, uh, a round came in the window and the fellow that was standing right in the doorway and blew the top out of his head, and I got a face full of splinters and oh. stuff. And that was your first wound? That was my first yeah. wound. And uh, so the lieutenant sent me, we, by that time some light tanks had gotten into town, so he sent me back to the aid station on the, one, one of the tanks, and another fella who had gotten a piece out of his neck when he, that shell went off was on the tank in front of me. On the way back, that tank got hit by a mortar shell, Ooh. and when he got back to the aid station, he had lost an arm and part of a leg. And Bad. Fortunately, I didn't lose anything more than I already had. The dot pulled the splinters out and dobbed me up and sent me back, and I went back to the battalion headquarters. So back to duty then? You didn't right go back. to the hospitalization no, or anything like that? right back to yeah. within the hour. <laughs> Not back into Hurlesheim, however, but oh. back to where the battalion headquarters was set okay. up, uh, just on the other side of the river. And I spent the night there with uh, Lieutenant Young of the Aranda Tank Platoon and the battalion commander. And during the night, they got they ordered uh, what was left of the battalion to pull out of Hurlesheim, which they did without too much problem. And uh, so we sat there for the next week or so, dug in along the river bank, and uh, then they decided to try and take the town again on the 16th. And uh, one of the other companies was, or other battalions was gonna take the town from one side and we went off in another direction. 
to go around it and take one of the other, a town called La Brumo. And uh, as we were going up there, I was, again, the radio operator, I was carrying a SCR 300 on my back. And uh, <clears throat> we got up alongside the stream there, and I laid, we stopped for a little bit, and I laid down behind a big pile of turnips or sugar beets, I never was sure which. Was laying there looking around to see where the company commander had gotten, and uh, that's when I got hit with a rifle bullet, and uh, I felt a sting in my shoulder, and I reached out to a guy that was laying over that way from me and said, I've been hit, and the next thing I knew, I was laying on my back, just coming to. Wow. Somehow I had turned over, and and I, with that sh thing on my back and just coming to, I could, couldn't move hardly. Well, when I finally became fully conscious, I rolled back on my stomach and crawled down into the riverbed, which was a little more, a more sheltered cover. and yeah. uh, a little more cover than the other place. And was down there for a while, and then Lieutenant Young comes along and says, we've been ordered to fall back to the waterworks on the other side of the river. And uh, you want to try and come with us, or do you want to stay here and take your chances? Be well, that was a rather, rather stupid question. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, a couple of the, a couple of my buddies says, "Come on, no problem. We'll, we'll stay with you." So Good. we ran down the water bank, water, river bank, heading toward the waterworks. And about halfway down, I ran out of breath. And said, what did it go into your shoulder through your lungs? It went in this shoulder, went through the right lung, and lodged in the mediastinum, which is the wall between the two lungs. Oh. And uh, if one of these fingers is the aorta and the other is the pulmonary artery, it went right between them when he went in to get it out. And he found that's where it was. But anyhow, so mm -hmm. these two guys said, well, we'll wait for you. So I took a breather, and then we got back to the aid station. And How far uh, did you have to travel, though? Oh, probably quarter, three, quarter to a half a mile somewhere in there. It wasn't a pleasant trip. Up there. No. So we got back there, and... <clears throat> A friend of mine who happened to be in the 17th Battalion, but he was a medic with the 17th, but he and I had been in ASTP together. And uh, so he, I, the only place it hurt was in the middle of my back, which cracked a rib as it was wandering around in there. And uh, so he just cut all my clothes off right down the middle of my back and peeled it back, and he sees this little teeny hole in my shoulder and says, uh, well, we put a Band-Aid on it, and then it loaded me up on the hood of a half-track back to the aid station. Well, on the way back to the aid station, the half-track I was on, on ran into a Jeep. <laughs> the driver oh. gets out and says, I'll see you later, and he packed out and proceeds to the aid station. I don't know whether you ever did see the Jeep driver <laughs> or not, but it's obviously a half-track. It does a pretty good job on a Jeep. Oh, yeah. And, uh, they don't mess around. <laughs> uh, so I got back to the aid station. They took one look at me, hung a tag on me, and just sat there outside the building until an ambulance came around and picked me up and hauled me back to the division clearing station. And up to this time, I was feeling pretty good. That wasn't bothering me too much. But? And I got back to the division clearing station and sitting on a gurney there. and. Surgeon walks up behind me and says, "Take some deep breaths," and I did, and wheezing in and out of this hole in my shoulder. So then they taped me up from my middle of my yeah. chest to the middle of my back, plugged that hole up. So now, when I breathe, the air is just going into the chest cavity instead of not up the shoulder. <laughs> yeah, and so then it starts filling up the cavity and pushing the mediastine in the other lung crowd knit. So then I began to feel a little uncomfortable. Well, they loaded me in another ambulance and hauled me back to a field hospital, and I got in there, and they took some x-rays, and then a doc comes over with a syringe and a needle. Started out with a little one, but wound up with one about like that. You pump air in you? No, pump air out. Out, okay. Just went in and drew out some fluid, and 
blood and what have you. Did it hit both lungs? Or no, just, just one. Just the one. No, we wouldn't be carrying on this conversation well, if it I hit know. both. Sometimes miracles happen, buddy. I know, but that, in this instance, that wasn't one of them. Uh, so he starts pumping this, and he, after a while he says, well, I can't stand here all day doing this. <laughs> so he took the syringe off, leaving the needle in, put a rubber hose on it, and stuck the other end in a bottle of water. And then they wheeled me into a ward and gave me a shot of morphine and a shot of penicillin. And <laughs> every three hours he comes around and wakes me up with a shot of penicillin. Somebody did. And every time I wake up, I'm just coming to the end of a reel of wire. <laughs> One of the other things I did, when, particularly when we were dug in outside of, of uh, base water there outside the waterworks uh, was run wire lines for telephones from the CP out to CP the, out to the red. out to the guys the holes on the line the <coughs> squads on the front line and so every time I'd wake up with a shot I'd just be coming to the end of a spool of wire <laughs> in my dreams so anyway I stayed there for day or so, one day I guess, and the next day I went back to a station hospital. Where was that? Back in France or in there Germany? It was, was all in France. Okay. And uh, we were... Uh, Get good treatment? Oh, very good treatment. Yeah. But anyway, got back to the station hospital and I'm laying in the bed just about lunchtime and I could barely open my mouth because my glands had all swollen up with air filling up all the subcutaneous tissue and everything and uh, <clears throat> get my mouth about like this. So they come around with big thick sandwiches about like that for lunch. Well, no way I can. <laughs> and then the, the ward surgeon walked in and he took a look at me and said, what's the matter with you soldier, you got the mumps? <laughs> Before he looked at the yeah. chart because both was swollen up just, just like mumps right would. Out, yeah. So then he looked at the chart and decided that wasn't the case. And uh, I there, that was there for one day, and then they moved me back to a field hospital, or to a, a general hospital, I mean, where a, a surgeon by the name of Brewer, Edwin Brewer, was taking a rest. Normally he worked in field hospitals, but he was back at this general hospital for, well, an hour and for a for rest, the doc, huh? yeah, where he could operate on schedule yeah. rather than as they carted him in. <clears throat> and uh, turns out he was considered to be the top thoracic surgeon in the army, and uh, he was, had been chest surgery, at, chest sur professor of chest surgery at the University of Michigan in our Ann Arbor before he was drafted or volunteered, whichever I don't mm -hmm. know. But in any event, so the ward surgeon says, "Well, I'm going to ride back with you in the ambulance just in case maybe I get a chance to see Brewer operate." But if not, at least I can make rounds with him and hear him describe the cases that he's got. He had a chest ward of about 200 patients there that in wow. the hospital I wound up in, which was an old, was housed in a... Well, how long were you hospitalized? 90 days total. Ooh. But uh, I was there at the 21st General for uh, about half of it. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that's where I was operated on, and then, well, when I first got back there, they just kept giving me blood transfusions and tapping my chest with the needle to drain it off fluid. And I was there for about a week, and they moved me upstairs. And uh, I wasn't getting penicillin anymore, and then pretty soon they come around and tied a red, little red bow on the bottom of my bed, which says penicillin again. and then. Uh, Chest medical doctor who had been tapping my chest uh, said, "Well, they're going to operate on you tomorrow." Well, it turned out it was the day after tomorrow before they did. Oh, but, but they did it. But so then I got wheeled in, and uh, you know what an operating room looks like in the states in a mm -hmm. hospital with all the big fancy lights and the tables and all that. Well, this operating room was a room about as wide as from here to the wall and that way from here to the wall. And the operating table was a gurney, and the lights were four 200-watt lights in a tin shield. 
And uh, so I'm laying there on the bed. Uh, Captain Hayflick, the anesthesiologist, uh, gets ready to put me under with some ether, so he puts the cone on my face, and I start to say the Hail Mary, and Captain Brewer says, or Major Brewer says, uh, just relax, Carol. He says, Captain Hayflick has put more men to sleep for chest surgery than any other man in the Army. Good. Which so by, you were in good Which hands. by implication says that he'd done more surgery than anybody else since yeah. they were a team. And uh, some six hours later, I woke up back in the ward oh. and uh, with Captain Hayflick sticking a needle in my arm to give me a blood transfusion. Well, most places when they give you a blood transfusion, they do it right in the joint so you mm. got to lock your arm. And I'll clue you, taking a pint of blood takes an awful lot longer than giving one. Well, yeah, it's all gravity feed. Well, but yeah, and it yeah. goes pretty slow. Yeah. But uh, in any case, Captain Hayflick put it in down here in the forearm so you didn't have to lock your elbow for that hour or so while uh -huh. you get that which Consider was far it. more comfortable. So I was in the hospital there at the 21st General for about six weeks. By that time I was ambulatory. and So I got shipped down to the 3rd General Hospital in aix province which is just outside of Marseille, and was down there for six weeks or so. And as it happened, just uh, down there, I had pajamas and boots, and that was it, and a bathrobe. So we were walking around. We got to go into town to USO shows at the theater, at the opera house in Aix. And in just your bathrobe? Just in our bathrobes, walking <laughs> into town. <laughs> well, there was a lot of us there. <laughs> and uh, so I saw a couple of USO shows there. and. Uh, one of the things I remember was a, uh, just a variety show, and there was this young lady singing, and very short, and she had a pretty well low-cut gown on, and the guy that was with her was about six foot two or six foot three, so he's standing there uh -huh. looking down the front. Yeah, that, that's what you're fighting for. <laughs> and uh, Bob singing, joke. <laughs> uh, working for the Yankee Dollar. Yeah. And, si, uh, uh, so. And by now, though, had they sent any wires home to your folks? Oh, giving many, you, many. You know, be advised at such and such. Oh, and yes, many, many. Stuff. I can show you a couple of those here. I just happen right. to have a few thousand. Well, my sister saved all this stuff oh, good. and made up a scrapbook. So there's the the first one that they got, which was sent on. It was received on 6 5 yeah, p.m. on the 7th of February. Yeah. Why don't you hold this up so you I'm going to when I turn. I was going to read it and then hold oh, it. Oh, well, read it and then show it. That's what I was going to Regret to inform you, <coughs> inform you your son, Private First Class Carol F. Kane, was seriously wounded in action. 16 January in France. Mail address follows. Direct from hospital with details. And then for the duration of my stay in the hospital, they got periodic updates from the Red Cross. Oh, good. And postcards. Mm -hmm. And uh, so where were we? we were talking about Aix in Province and uh, walking around in our bathrobes. Uh, while I was in Aix, uh, President Roosevelt was died. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, so they had a special requiem mass in the chapel for for him, which we all attended, of course. And then uh, there was a ruling that if you were hospitalized for over 90 days, you had to be returned to the zone of the interior, which was either England at that time or back to the States. Well, um, there was another fellow there who was in, I think it was in the 82nd, he was a mortar gunner. And uh, at some point in time, they were really 
in trouble, and they were two guys were throwing mortar shells into a mortar, one right mm -hmm. after the other. Well, he didn't get his hand out of the way uh -oh. before the round came back out, and he had a thumb badly lacerated. And uh, so one or the other or both of us were going to have to be discharged or sent back home because it came to be the 90th day, mm -hmm. and they all of a sudden realized that it was the 90th day. They got to do something with us. Yeah. Well, I think he went home, but in my case, they suddenly decided, well, he, can, he doesn't need to go home. So they quickly found me a uniform, and by 4 o'clock that afternoon, I was out of the hospital and in a repo devil. Oh, is that when you got into the EAA outfit? Uh, ultimately, yeah. I stayed in the repo depot for two weeks and outside of Marseille, and then was put on a train with about 50 guys on a civilian train and went up to, through Paris, to down to Etampes, which is south of Paris, to another repo depot and was there from the middle of April until the 1st of May. And the 1st of May, I got assigned to anti-aircraft brigade headquarters battery in Maastricht, Holland. So gets up there and got assigned to operate a switchboard. By the time I got up there, I found out that Captain Fairburn had given me a MOS, a military specialty number yeah. of communications non-commissioned officer. Well, I was a, a private first class and uh, communications officer of the outfit I got in as a master sergeant. So obviously <laughs> I wasn't going to get that job. You didn't get a field promotion right <laughs> on the <No>. spot. <laughs> and uh, so I wound up being a switchboard operator while I was there in Maastricht oh. for a telephone switchboard. And we had a battalion scattered all over Holland and Germany. But we had to talk to every by wireline. Every morning we had to Make the loop. Excuse me, check in to make sure that they were still all with us. And uh, so I operated a switchboard there for. Was a that while. good duty? Yeah, it was in Maastricht, it was very nice. Yeah, good quarters, a, good food. We were living in a, a uh, school for uh, young boys studying to be brothers, Catholic brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were living in their dormitories. And. Uh, they were, some of them were still there at the school. So we used to play soccer with them, or volleyball, I mean, because the brigadier was a nut on volleyball, so we oh, always were playing everybody volleyball. Everybody had to play volleyball. Yeah, and the kids loved to play with us, too. They were high school age boys, mm. which means they weren't that much younger than we were. I know. And uh, <clears throat> all of them could speak English. None of us could speak Dutch or very, or hardly any. Maybe one or two guys could speak some Dutch or German, but or French. But these kids could all speak German, Dutch, French, and Flemish. Yeah, they make you feel silly sometimes. They and uh, switch gears all over the place. Yeah. Right? So uh, we were there. I was there until the war ended. And uh, when the war ended on the eighth of May, the uh, was pretty quiet in Holland because the Dutch were all celebrated out. They were celebrating the liberation of Western Holland the day before. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so things were pretty quiet as far as the, the local populace celebrating the end of the war. <laughs> they were still sleeping from the day before. But while in Holland, uh, I stayed there until about the end of uh, May, because the brigadier pulled some strings and got the brigade uh, transferred to the States to go to Japan. Oh, good so deal. They were out of Europe by the 1st of June. Okay. However, they were part of 9th Air Force, and 9th Air Force, in its infinite wisdom, decided that anybody going to Japan that had people in excess of their table of organization and certain military specialties, one of which was communications non-commissioned officer, I didn't get to go. So I got transferred to an automatic weapons battalion, which an automatic weapons battalion has uh, quad 50 millimeters on a, in this instance they were towed, on a trailer and 40 millimeter 
single barrel anti-aircraft guns. And so I got transferred up to this automatic weapons battalion up in Munson Gladbach in Germany, up in the Rhineland. And I'd never seen either one of those guns before in my life, but, yeah, but here they, I you go. You were told you were a specialist. <laughs> yeah. So I gets up there, and they didn't need a communications non-com either, so I wound up as a basic non-specialist in the gun section. Was that how you qualified for your combat injury badge? No, I com qualified for way, that way, way back. Yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so in uh, up in Munson Gladbach, uh, being a disabled vet, so to speak, whenever they went on long marches or anything else, I didn't. I managed to weasel out of doing any of that oh. kind of nonsense. So I stayed <laughs> stayed in, in camp and did whatever I had to or could, operate a switchboard or something. Oh, yeah. okay. And uh, again, I wound up being a switchboard operator after I got up to Gladbach. And we were in a British zone of occupation, so we stayed there until for, around the 4th of July. Well, by the time, that time, we were able to, right after the war ended, we were able to ride home and tell somebody what, where really we yeah. were, hmm. not where we were physically okay. located. And. Uh, my mother used to stay at the stations every day, and the, during the wintertime, the church at home was kind of dark after she got off work. So she'd go to the hospital, which was just a block up the street. It was a Catholic hospital run by the nuns, uh, Sisters of St. Francis. And uh, one of the nuns up there had a sister who was also a nun, but she was in Maastricht. And uh, they hadn't heard from her for quite some time, many months, maybe even years. And mother was talking to one of the nuns after she said stations one night, and said sister so-and-so, or said that I was in Maastricht. And she said, oh, sister so-and-so has a sister that's in Maastricht and we haven't heard from her. Do you think Carol could possibly yeah. find out if there's, Good deal. if she's around? So <clears throat> mother wrote and told me where she, who she was and what. So I went downtown from, well, by that time I was in once in Gladbach. But I got a pass to go back to Maastricht and went down to the place where the nuns were supposed to be, their convent downtown, and found out that the army had taken that over and the nuns weren't there. But I also found out that they had a place out in the countryside a mile or two out of town where the nuns had moved on a farm-like place. So I walked out there you didn't commandeer a jeep or anything? No, I just hiked out. Back in those days, walking a mile wasn't much of it. Okay. And uh, went up and knocked on the door, and the nun that answered the door didn't speak English, but she went and got the mother superior, who did. And uh, I told her why I was there. Oh, yeah, sister so-and-so is. She's out in the field haying. So they sent for her, and she came in. And, uh, she didn't speak English either. And I didn't speak Dutch, so we had an interesting conversation with Mother Superior as the He's interpreter. The yeah. Interpreter. Yeah, and uh, then I was able to write home and say that I had seen Sister and she was in good health and they were all fine. Good. And uh, went back to Munson Gladbach. And while we were up there, uh, the Morgenthau policy was supposedly in effect. I don't know whether you're familiar with that or not, but... The what? I didn't hear you. Morgenthau. You remember the Secretary of the Treasury? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, he signed all my dollar bills. Yeah. Well, he was obviously anti-Nazi, and so uh, he caused a policy called non-fraternization to yeah. be put in place where we weren't supposed to have anything to do with any of the Germans, That's it. which That's just for obviously talking. wasn't exactly the most popular thing with the GIs. And uh, as we were in a British zone, we had a lieutenant that happened to be very uh, interested in enforcing the Morgenthau Doctrine. Oh. And uh, so the Brits there, they, they didn't pay any attention to the Morgenthau document. They weren't doctrine. They weren't interested in it. And so they were happily fraternizing <laughs> whenever they got a chance. <laughs> and uh, this lieutenant was harassing them some, so they quietly passed the word that 
tell him to you know, stay in off. camp or he's going to find a shiv in his back. Yeah. And uh, That's not anyway, good. he decided rather than sleep in his tent, he stayed up at battalion headquarters, which was in a house across the, camp, the airfield. Fortunately for him, he did because one of our guys got liquored up one night, Ooh. stitched up his tent with his Tommy gun right down across his bed. <laughs> I don't, well, how long I don't remember what happened to him, but... Did, after all of these moving back and forth, when did you finally get back to the States? I got back in the States in December. I actually 44. wound up in January of 46. Okay. I left Europe in, in, in December of 45. Now, how was your welcoming home? Was it... Uh, well, we got... We landed at uh, uh, Newport News oh. and wound up at Camp Patrick Henry and of course they laid on a big big steak dinner for us with oh, yeah. uh, all kinds of milk yeah. which we hadn't had much of before. Not the powdered cow. No. And uh, was there for just a couple of days really. Okay. And uh, when you got home, what was the greeting? Did you just kind of walk in and mom and say, hey, it's all over, I'm home, or were well, they expecting you? They were expecting me, and uh, <clears throat> I got in on the train about 6 o'clock in the morning, I guess it was, and a very good friend of my father's, who I had also used to go hunting with, uh, actually he got to the railroad station before my folks did, oh. and so he was the first one that greeted me when I got off the train. And uh, then Dad and, I don't, remember the, I don't think Mom came down to the station. Yeah. Dad and my brother came down. Great. And then we went home and. Yeah, and had some fun. Had some quietly and then I. Uh, Did you join any outfits like the Legion or When I got AFW home, I, I joined the Legion. Okay. And uh, while I was in Alliance, I was active in the Legion. Mm -hmm. I was home for, well, from dis from uh, January until June, and I worked for my dad as an electrician. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, I went back to school. Okay, on the GI Bill? On the, well, well you're a PL 316, I, weren't you? I started on the GI Bill 346. Okay. And then I wound up getting my compensation, so then I switched over for the second semester to Public Law 16, which mm -hmm. is a little bit better. Yeah, I know that. Financially. Yeah. And uh, so actually I could have gone on and got my master's on one or the other of them, but I didn't. Is that when you went, you started with GE or did you work some other place before you transferred into GE? No, I went to work for GE directly out of college. What have you done since? What? What have you done since with respect to GE and everything here in Pittsfield? Well, when I went to work for GE, of course, I started on their test engineering program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I worked in Fort Wayne, Indiana for about six months, seven months. I had one test when I first got there in uh, uh, wage rate, actually. Yeah. And the, they had far more test engineers than they knew what to do with <laughs> because they're all getting in out. 49 <clears throat> they made their usual number of offers expecting that they would get the usual number of acceptances but nobody else was making any offers so everybody accepted oh, yeah. and fortunately for us and that wouldn't have happened today in general electric but then they took us all and uh, in many instances, they didn't have any particular thing to do with this. And like I said, I wound up, well, initially I was supposed to go to to uh, Evendale. By jet engines? To jet engines. Yeah. But before I got there, I got a letter from a gal by the name of B. Hawking, which you may have heard of, too. Mm -hmm. She was the gal over in Schenectady that was in charge of assigning people to oh, yeah. test, in, test assignments, uh, saying, no, report to Fort Wayne. Oh. So I did, 
And when I got to Fort Wayne, they didn't have anything to do with us either, really. So the first two weeks I was there, myself and a fellow by the name of George Hero wound up over in the personnel office going through all the records of everybody that worked at Fort Wayne, adjusting their service dates. Oh. Because as a result of the strike in 46, they had played games with the service dates, oh. and then the union complained. No, we, and we, we, let's not go into that. But anyhow, <laughs> so I did that, and then I wound up in this wage rate assignment, which was initially getting planning sheets and going through a book and telling the operator how much money he was going to get paid for doing oh. the work. I did that for a while, and then when I'd get done with it in the morning, I had a real great boss. And he says, uh, when you get them all finished, just go out on the floor and wander around and okay. stick your nose now, into what's going on. Um, as a wrap-up, I've got to cut this short yeah. a little bit, I think, but all your experiences, what would you summarize, if you will, your service experiences, how it's affected your life, your family, well, your history? Obviously, it's one thing it did was it... Uh, caused me to be far more diligent in school when I got back to school after yep. I got in than I was when I... No fun and games. No, okay. you were there to get the job done. Yeah. And, uh, of course, the uh, it's given me a, a small income that uh, is tax-free, yeah. and uh, that helps. Yeah. I, I use that for my travel allowance. Well, for trips we're going to travel stuff. right now, I think. I'm, man says, let's wrap Call it, it up. So let me say this. I thank you, and we all thank you for You're sharing welcome. with us. And by golly, I hope to see you around for a long time to come. I hope so, too. Bob. Amen. Thank you, We've Carol. We've had good times together. Amen. You're welcome. Thank you, folks. <laughs>